open script and I'ma read it right. Study to show thyself approved. You got to read it right. Every day hell, I'm just trying to show eternal life. Life, I'm just trying to show eternal life. Life, this burning all at midnight. Who shall, who shall teach knowledge, make them understand doctrine? Who shall teach knowledge, make them understand doctrine? Who shall, who shall teach knowledge, make them understand doctrine? Line up on line, line, line up on line. Who shall, who shall teach knowledge, make them understand doctrine? Who shall teach knowledge, make them understand doctrine? Who shall, who shall teach knowledge, make them understand doctrine? Line up on line. Open script. We live mm -hmm. right now. Yes. Hey, peace, everybody. Blessed Sabbath from Brother Jediah. Welcome to another episode of Welcome to another episode of Burning Midnight Oil. Tonight our our uh, lesson will be called End Time Pro. Well, it, 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 it's called End Time Prophecy: The Truth of the Raptured Church. So, um, here at Burning Midnight Oil, we come to you around midnight on Friday evening. And we give you 12 scriptures on the subject that's going to help, better help you understand the subject matter. Try to keep it as simple as possible most of the time. I got my older kids here with me. And I'm really just trying to tell them, a truth, tell them the truth of what their dads understand in the Bible, you know. So you get it pretty raw, pretty uncut, you know. And I try to keep it as simple as possible. So today... um. We're looking at some end time prophecy, the truth of the rapture church. So really what we're going to look at is this whole rapture thing and where it came from. And is it real? How does it work? How, you know, what is the end time? Like, like, get, you know, like, okay. So, so here's the rapture. The rapture is God is going to execute some type of vengeance on the earth. And before he executes this vengeance he's going to rapture the church off and people who die they're gonna come up out the grave and they're gonna all come up and be in heaven with god while he while he putting his destruction down on the earth that's what the rapture is so the rapture is like the caught up part when people leave and and, and meet god in the sky it has a couple of scriptures that that, that people try to use to support it, the rapture, that people just going to leave this place. So we'll start with that, and then we'll get into more detail of what's going to happen. Um, So again, a rapture is like, okay, the Lord going to inflict this great tribulation um, and on the earth, and the church is going to be taken away so they don't have to deal with it. It'll be raptured off. This tribulation period is seven years, typically. This is what people say. Okay? So we're going to let the Bible tell us what it is. Hey, go ahead. Put up a 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And it starts off with verse... 16 and 17, when you get there, 1 Thessalonians. Really? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh. You're holding up everything. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. So when you get there, go ahead. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Mm -hmm. Then when, then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. All right. So that's one of the scriptures you'll um, find where people try to use that and say, you know, because they're telling you there that you're going to be caught up 
into the cloud, for the Lord himself should descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. So actually this term rapture comes from that word caught up. So technically, they're the same word. Now, what a lot of people don't know, the word rapture, it's not even in the Bible. Yet, it's a term. Uh, Britannica doesn't support it. Because as I was putting together the research, that set of Britannica, I was going to read what rapture was out of there. You know what I mean, it act like that word don't even exist. You know what I'm saying? Because... It's like, yo, what is this? Like, it knows. We're going to read. We're going to find out what it's say, you know, uh, uh, in Wikipedia, at least, about rapture. But that's one of the verses. Also, let's go to Matthew 24. Uh -huh. Matthew chapter 24. We're going to read 40 and 41. Matthew chapter 24, 40 and 41. Here's another scripture that people use. To support their theory of the rapture. Matthew chapter 24. And it's 40 and 41. When you get there, go ahead and read. Then shall, then shall two be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. Uh -huh. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. The one shall be taken and the other left. So that's another scripture. We're going to clear this up before we're done. So... People read that scripture and they're like, oh, okay. This must be when the Lord come back. He's going to come and rapture them. It's going to be two people in the field. One going to be there. And we're going to take one. And that's a pretty tough scripture when you just take that set of verses and just read them like that. Um, <clears throat> and that's one of the problems with the Bible is that you don't read the Bible like that. You know, you're supposed to read the Bible line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. You, know, you you piece it together, but you don't just grab a piece of the Bible and say, bam, and formulate a doctrine from two scriptures. It just don't work like that. Now, before we finish uh, this chapter, let's go. And we're going to look and see what uh, where this where this rapture came from. So I just simply uh, Googled the rapture origin. And the first thing that appears is where the word come from. So, rapture, rapture or seizing, rapture or seizing and carrying off. So the word rapture came from a word that they saying like to seize or to take away or carry off. All right, now we're going to look at it under Wikipedia now. The rapture, so we're in Wikipedia, which is an online encyclopedia. The rapture is an eschological theological position held by some Christians, particularly within branches of America evangelism. So they say like, especially in America, evangelism is like, you see these preachers on TV and stuff, that's they, they supposed to, or they supposed to be evangelizing. Like they supposed to be, evangelism when you go out and you preaching to people, you know, preaching the gospel to other people. It says, American evangelism, consisting of an end-time event. This is what the rapture is. When all Christian believe who are alive, along with the resurrected believers, will rise in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. The origin of the term extends from Paul, the apostle, first epistle to the Thessalonians in the Bible, in which he uses the Greek word harpios. So, like, where we was at in Thessalonians, they're saying that's the origin of where the rapture came from. All right? So, that's the scripture that they're using. All right? Um, all right. So, here's another part of the chapter. Most Christian denominations do not subscribe to rapture theory, the, uh, theology and have different interpretations of the aerial gathering described in First Thessalonians. So they're saying throughout Christianity, they don't all feel the same about this rapture. They got different theories like one is in the middle of the seven years, the, the rapture is going to come. Uh, another is the church going to go through it and then they're going to get raptured. 
And then another is uh, at the beginning of the seven years, it's going to be a, a rapture. So those are like your different types of theories on when the rapture is. Um, Let's see if I can. I know where it started. The actual doctrine started um, and because it's an American doctrine. And here's what happened. And I'm just going to give you like a, a quick rundown of what how the rapture really started because I'm not really seeing it in this particular chapter. I mean, in this particular setting of, of, of definition or whatever, encyclopedia, but I could probably look and find it through here if I look hard enough. But there was a, an evangelistic, evangelistic preacher. His name was William Miller, if I'm not mistaken. And he started the Seven Day Adventist movement, the Jehovah's Witness movement. They came from this movement that William Miller had. William Miller had a whole bunch of people before the internet. And he had a whole bunch of people out in the middle in the Midwest, like some maybe Kansas or something like that. And for two years in a row, he was like, yo, the Lord are gonna come back. And he never did. Okay? So after the third year, yeah, William Miller, that's his name. William Miller was an American Baptist preacher who is credited with beginning the mid 19th century North American religion movement known as Millerism. Yeah. So, anyway, so after the third time of him saying that the Lord was going to come back, it was like, ooh, the Lord can come back any day now. Based off, because he was like, well, he can come on two times, so he can come any day now. And that's where your, that's where your start of the rapture come. So, this dude had a revival out there in, in the woods or whatever yearly and after the, it kept saying the lord gonna come back the lord gonna come back he never came so here's the thing is will the lord come back any day and that's where your rapture come from now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go back to matthew 24 and we're gonna let matthew 24 where jesus starts breaking down what's gonna happen in the end we're gonna let that tell its own story so we're gonna go to verse three matthew 24 and verse three when you get there go ahead and read and as he sat Upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So looking at verse 3, the writer Matthew is going to answer these questions. The sign of the Lord's coming and the end of the world. All of this is going to be in this particular chapter. Go ahead. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed. That no man deceive you. So the first thing you need to do is make sure you're not deceived. And the only way that you're not going to be deceived is if you've been studying and reading and you have an idea or a clue yourself. You got to have your own thought process on it. And you need to be the right one. Otherwise, you've been deceived. Go ahead. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. So the first thing he said is, because there's going to be people coming in Jesus' name, saying Jesus is the Christ. Or either they say they made the Christ. It don't matter. But he like, but they're going to still be out here deceiving. Go ahead. And he shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. So this is what's going to happen before the Lord come back. It's got to be all kind of wars. It's like we was just, I don't even know if we're still over there. We're still over there fighting. In, where was that? Uh, Ukraine. The Ukraine? Okay. Yeah. I think I seen somewhere they bombed up some building the other day. You know what I mean? Wars and rumors of wars. It gets to the point where we're immune to it. We not even we forgot it's a war going on. Go ahead. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Right, but it's it like he said, even though that's gonna happen, like the end comes with something specific before we just like okay, we there. Go ahead. For a nation shall rise against nation, mm -hmm. and kingdom against kingdom. Yep. And there shall be famines and pestilence. And earthquakes in diverse places. So it's just like, um, and if you see Matthew 24, verse 7, that's, that verse is where the 24-7 show come from. But he say, for, for uh, nations shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. So like that, uh, what's the uh, ep epidemic that just passed by? COVID? That's not going to be the last of it. Like there's going to be more stuff to come. And they're going to have more vaccines and more trying to make demands. And, 
You know, maybe it's going to be earthquakes in diverse places. Like earthquakes or natural disasters even. Or pestilence or what well, we can't even eat, famines. All these things are going to take place before the Lord come back. So it's going to get worse than it is now. Go ahead. All these things are the beginning of sorrow. And notice that's what it said. This stuff is the beginning of the sorrow. Go ahead. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Uh -huh. And then shall and then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Go ahead. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Yes. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. So as we're looking at this end, he says, as we approach the end, people are gonna have more hatred than love. The love of many is waxing cold. That's why we see what we see on a daily basis. We see life getting worse because that's what's happening before the Lord come back. More and more hatred. Go ahead. He that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Your objective is you got to keep doing this until we get to the end. Go ahead. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. Mm -hmm. And then shall the end. And then shall the end come. He said, "Look, and before we get to the end." Everybody going to have at least heard this gospel. The gospel that Jesus is going to set his kingdom up on earth. That's what we're talking about. Go ahead. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation. Yep. Spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Stand in the holy place. Uh -huh. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Okay, good. So let's go to Daniel now. Let's go look at this Daniel the prophet. And let's uh, see what he had to say about this abomination of desolation. So. The abomination of desolation is the, the, the stand in the holy place. Jerusalem is the holy place. And I do this a lot. Abomination. I always think about the abominable snowman. But really, the abominable snowman was against Christmas. The abomination of desolation would be against Christ. He would be the Antichrist. So the Antichrist got to come on the scene. And Daniel spoke about him. We're going to read a little bit here. He, gave, he spoke a lot about him. We're just going to read a little. So really the Antichrist got to come on the scene before we can, or the abomination of desolation, before we can be like, oh yeah, the Lord's coming back. So William Miller was wrong. The Lord just can't come back. You know what I mean? Like something got to, this got to happen. Okay. So Daniel 11 and 31. An arm shall stand on his part. So it was talking about somebody in this Daniel 11. And it's saying, when we get to verse 31, it's like, what they was talking about, he going to have a military now. All right, it's the Antichrist who they were talking about. So it says the arm shall stand on his part, this Antichrist. But go ahead. And they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength. Yep. And shall take away the daily sacrifice. Uh huh. And they shall place the abomin abomination that make it desolate. Go ahead. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt with flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong. And do exports. So you're going to have this dude, he's going to come in with arms or military. He's going to take away the daily sacrifice. So that's something that you're going to look for. All of a sudden, you're going to see, oh, they're sacrificing every day. Like, they're not doing it now. Meaning, you don't know or haven't heard of any particular church, when you do your research, that is sacrificing, let alone in Jerusalem. And they ain't even gave you a reason yet. This is the daily sacrifice is the reason. I'm saying we're not at that point yet. So the end can't come yet. But then it says, um, but when he does come, then it says, and such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flattery. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. So during this uh, time period of this abomination of desolation, which we're going to learn about as we hear in the end time prophecy, um, it's like he like it's a people that know that God gonna be strong and exploit. Well, based off the theory of the rapture, the people that know that God gonna leave. They're not gonna be here. Keep reading. And they and they that understand among the people shall instruct many. Right, so it's saying and if you understand, then you're gonna be instructed many. But again, based off the theory of the rapture, who you trying to instruct? All the good people gone. Keep reading. Yet they shall fall by the sword. And notice, because what the theory of the rapture is now is you get raptured so you don't have to deal with the tribulation or the wrath that comes from, from, from the Antichrist. Here, it says, uh, and they shall, 
and yet they shall fall by the sword and go at us. And by flame, by captivity, and by spoil, many days. So this man is uh, leading up the uh, 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 Calvary to have people fall by the sword, catch them on fire, lock them up, many days. Go ahead. Now when they shall fall, they shall be hoping with a little help. But many shall cleave to themselves for, to them with flattery. Uh-huh, go ahead. And some of them of understanding shall fall. So I hear it says some people who understand, they're going to still fall. They're going to get killed during the tribulation period. We're going to see that tribulation term in a little bit. Go ahead. To try them mm -hmm. and to purge and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. Now notice what 35 did. 35... Helped us. It was like a basketball player passing the rock, giving an assist. Because the subject is the end time, right? That's what we was talking about in Matthew 24. So it says in verse 35, And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. So he's saying this is going to take place all the way at the end. But we saw in Matthew 24, you got this antichrist, this abomination of desolation. All right, go ahead. And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. And this is what's making him abominable. Because he's saying, like, he he a man, but he placing himself above God. Go ahead. And shall speak marvelous things against the God of God, mm -hmm. and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. For that that is deter de determined shall be done. Mm -hmm. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, yep. nor regard any God. Mm -hmm. For he shall magnify himself above all. Go ahead. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces. Mm -hmm. And a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. That's good. So if you understand what's going on, the office of this Antichrist comes from the Pope. But the Pope don't be walking around here like, I'm the man, I'm powerful than God. Like they walk around under the banner of Jesus. But it's saying when we get to the end, it was like, yo, verse 37, neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor desire women, nor regard any God, for he should magnify himself above all. It's like, this dude's going to be different. As we approach the end, you're going to have somebody in there that's different. And when I mean different, like, we're going to read about some popes. I'm saying this dude more ruthless than them. All right? Um, Revelation chapter 6. Let's find this guy some more in the New Testament now. We're looking at end time prophecy. The truth of the rapture, church, the great tribulation. Revelation chapter 6. And when you get to verse 1, go ahead and read. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, mm -hmm. and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder. Yep. One of the four beasts saying, come and see. Uh -huh. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. So... What we're about to do right here is we are opening what the Bible wants to call the seals. So when John, the revelator, was looking up in heaven, he's, you know, basically he saw that nobody was worthy to open the seals but Jesus. So Jesus is opening up the seals, showing us what's going to happen in the end. Go ahead. And he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he, and he went forth conquering. And to conquer. So what we're going to do is as we look at the seals, we're about to introduce from the New Testament perspective this Antichrist. In the first seal, it says, And I beheld a white horse, verse 2. And he that sat on him had a bow, and the crown was given unto him, so he a king. And he went forth conquering and to be conquered. So this dude, and he's coming from the Catholic Church. So this guy is uh, going to be a conqueror, a ruler, verse 3. When he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, 
and power was given to him that sat there on to take peace from the earth, uh -huh. and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. Mm -hmm. And when he had opened... So now we're seeing that he had he went to conquer, and now we're seeing that peace is being taken away from the earth. Okay? This is what the Bible is going to let it call, or we're going to let it read the Great Tribulation. So this is the Antichrist. He's taking peace from the earth. Did you start at five yet? No, not yet. Go ahead. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. Yeah. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. So when we get to verse uh, 5 and, and 6, now we see seeing that it was like uh, uh, this beast come and see, and I beheld a, a, a black horse. And he that had sat on him had a pair of balances. And what we're learning is a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. This dude going to have control of the money. Go ahead. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. Yeah. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death. And hail followed with him, and power was given unto them, over the fourth part of the earth, to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beast of the earth. And when he had... All right, that's good. So now we're saying that the fourth seal, it was like, yo, when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard a voice come from heaven. He was like, look, behold, a pale horse, and his name that of him was death, and hell followed him. So this is what's going to happen. There's going to be a lot of bloodshed during this time when this dude is the lead. Which we saw in Daniel 11 when it was like, yo, but people who know they God, they're going to exploit this guy. But they was like, and they was like, he going to get a little help. But arms going to come, our military going to come with this dude. You know what I mean? He ain't just coming in. Antichrist ain't just coming in. Oh, yo, I'm the Antichrist, the head of the church. You know what I'm saying? Follow me. Like, nah. It's not, he going to come in bringing peace, all of that. He going to be the great deceiver. And he's going to control everything. Now, a lot of people like to put America... In, in, in prophecy. And I have a book called The Millennium. And it's by a writer named Tex Mars. Now, the thing about America is, and a lot of people don't understand that America is not going to be a country till the end. Um, America was a made country. That's why it's called the United States of America. It's United States because in Europe, they're divided states. Each country is is called a state. I don't know if you know that. You know what I'm saying? Like even the United States is a state. You know what I'm saying? That's why we got stuff like terms like the State of the Union. Um, and so when they made America, they made it as a perfect version of Europe. They got the Magna Carta. We got the Constitution. You know. And so, um. In order for this Antichrist to rise, America got to die. So I'm reading, I got this book here, and it's an older book. That's the reason why we're looking at it. This book was written in 1992, if I'm not mistaken. I want to tell you, 1992. Um, let's see if I can find the copyright on it. Uh, 1990. Millennium Copyright by Tex Mars, 1990. It's relevant. 1990, you want to know what color money was? Green. Pure green. Like greenback green. All right? So I'm reading out of this chapter, and it says, when will the dollar die? That's what we're reading out of here. When will the dollar die? Because in Revelation, it's like this dude going to be controlling the money. Well, America controls the money right now. The day the dollar died, no one came to its funeral. Indeed, the sad but inescapable fact is that few realized that the dollar had passed away. Even today, many who cherish the dollar, the most are blissfully unaware of its demise. Those who are most gullible and unquestioning are convinced that the dollar will live forever. 
that it is like an eternal living creature whose vibrancy and energetic bounce will be seen and felt and heard throughout the world for eons to come. But they are wrong. The dollar is dead. We have only to await its funeral. Even now, if we listen closely enough, we can hear the first stanza of the inevitable dir dirge and burial music. So this guy saying, Tex Mars, he's like, the dollar dead. We just don't know it yet. And if the dollar's dead, the country's dead. No one but its assassins are quite sure of the exact moment and date the dollar died. Those in the know have come to the conclusion that the life force of the dollar first began to ebb away slowly and inex inexorably sometime in January 1980. During the eventful months, an amazing event occurred in the world marketplace. Men everywhere began to clamor for gold, the most precious metal. The world speculators and investors as well as the little men and women in the street bid up the price of gold to an astounding $875 an ounce. It seemed as if it was out of, uh, it, it, it seemed as if the word was out. The dollar was in a very desperate shape. For the own economy and financial salvation, the world had turned to the only commodity which throughout the centuries have assured safety, preservation, gold. So, I guess in 1980, we ran the money. We they, they saying that, look, whatever the price of gold was before, our dollar was strong. After that, it became weak. Now, I'm not going to read all of this. I do want to get to something, though, that I found in this chapter that came to pass. Um, oh, let's see. I'm sorry. I do want to read this, and I, I, I had it, and I, and there's a lot of stuff in here, but I just want to read this one part, uh, this prediction here, uh, all right, let's see, no cash needed, the plans for this smart car. He tell he see he tell us about everything that pretty much we do now. How we got the, the guy y'all y'all can read the book, but I I I really want to read where he starts talking about he starts talking about in this book um that that the money was gonna change colors and this was nineteen what we said ninety that he wrote this mm -hmm. and he gonna start talking about the money changing colors and. What that's supposed to mean. All right, so I think I found it. Um, money is controlled in power. It goes without saying that whoever controls the money controls the country. Congressman Ron Paul himself noted this fact when he said, if you control the money, you actually control every, every transaction that exists in this country. That is why this is such an important issue. If you control the money, you can do particularly anything you want with the people. Yes, there's power in money. The power of money can be very oppressive. A few years ago, the influential Washington Post newspaper printed an article entitled The Coloring of Greenbacks, which discussed the possibility of the new money being issued and the old recall. Interestingly enough, the article began with a very cryptic phase. Oh, money, we love you. We hate you. And we are ever conscious of your power. 400 years, kings and emperors and popes and militaries, dictators, assorted madmen have established control over the most minute detail of everyday human lives by controlling the issue and use of money. Money is control. Um, man, I have... Oh, okay, here we go. What will the new money, when will the new money be issued? As Congressman Paul noted, it is extremely difficult to get to the truth about when and how the new money will be issued. In the mid-1987, 
I began to communicate with the Department of Treasury in Washington, D.C. to see if it could get to the bottom of the new money situation. After encountering countering some delay and rather cloudy answer on part of the Treasury officials, finally on June 16, 1987, I received a letter from the Department of Treasury, Bureau of Engraving and Printing in Washington, D.C. They make the money, or they're responsible, confirming that there were indeed plans afoot to create a new money. Here below is the portion of this letter. So in 1987, they said they're going to create new money. And when they said they're going to create a new money, the reason we're looking at this is because at some point, this antichrist is going to control the money. I'm trying to show us, you three, and my listening audience, I'm trying to show us that the dollar that we have, that the scholars are saying, has no value. So it's going to make it easy for this guy to control the money when he does. When he does. Last March, the Department of Treasury announced changes would be made to the United States paper currency. First, a clear polyester thread would be incorporated into the paper. So, like, when y'all look at y'all money, mm -hmm. it's a piece of, it's a thread in there. That wasn't always there. This is before. We're reading about before this happened. 1990. This is when this is written. Money was green. With no paper in it. You know what I mean? First, a clear polyester thread would be incorporated into the paper. Arranged vertically through a narrow, clear field on the note. And could be seen by the human eye when the note is held to the light source. The thread would contain printed information consisting of the letters USA and the dominational value of that specific note. Second, the word United States of America would be microprinted repeatedly in a circle around a portion of the face of the note. Now, he's saying all this. I don't know if, if that happened, that part. The purpose of these changes is to continue to protect the public currency transaction by deterring counterfeiters. The development of advanced color copying machines that permit high resolution color reproductions even by unskillful operation is rapidly increasing the future of the widespread availability of such copiers threaten to create a new kind of problem involving so-called casual counterfeiters so they're saying they're doing this they're changing the money up to stop the counterfeiters um then he says concurrently the Bureau is in the process of procuring production quantities of the threaded paper. Additionally, additional time will be required. Uh, man, let's see. I'm trying to see. I thought that's where he's going to start talking about the change of the money color. Uh, I don't want to have to read all of this. And I read it before I started. And I really do want to read to y'all where they're talking about changing the color of the money. And I guess I lost it. But... Uh, we're not going to take all the time in the world trying to find it either. And maybe I can show you guys later. But in here, he discusses changing, like how the money going to go, why the money changing colors. Because basically the money don't exist no more. So they playing with it. They can do whatever the heck they want to do with it. Um, because at the end of the day, and we'll leave text Mars alone for now. At the end of the day, this Antichrist, is going to have control of the money. See, what I want people to understand is when you control the money, it don't matter if America's a country or not. Because a lot of people be trying to find America in the prophecy. America is Europe. They're the police dog for Europe. Anyway, back to Revelation chapter 6. Pick it up at verse 9. When he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God uh -huh. and for the testimony which they held. Uh -huh. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Uh -huh. And white white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest <clears throat> yet for a little season unto their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Okay, good. That's fine. So we also seeing, as we look at these seals, we seeing more death going to happen. He was like, look. He was like, he looked and he saw 
uh, 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 people crying with a loud voice saying, "How long, Lord, are you gonna, you know, judge, you know, get our revenge?" And this is like people that's dead. All these people dead. They not. This is a vision. It's not really happening. You know what I'm saying? It's a vision. And he was like, "Nah." So more people got to die. So this is gonna all take place during that great tribulation period. So people gonna be getting killed. All right. Now let's go to Revelation chapter thirteen. Revelation chapter 13. Just so y'all know, we're on our fifth scripture. So this is going to be a little longer than normal. You know what I mean? But we're going to get an understanding like, of the rapture and the, the events of the end time period. You know what I mean? Like, that's what we're looking at right now. Revelation chapter 13. Let's pick this up in verse 4. And they, Go ahead. And they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. Uh -huh. And they worshiped the beast, saying... Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Keep going. And there was given a, un, unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemy. Now remember we already looked in Daniel and we seeing somebody that's coming on the scene and he ain't gonna regard none of the guys of his fathers. Like he, he gonna pro pro profess himself to be God, right? That's blasphemous. So this is that same person and it said, and it was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue 40 and 2 months. So 12 plus 12 is 24. Plus another 12, that's 36. Plus 6 more, that's 42. 12, the reason we're using that, that's how many, pretty much how many months it is in a year. So that's three and a half years. That's the point we're getting at. So for three and a half years is when we read in Revelation 6 how he going how he gonna be the king and he gonna conquer. When we read that in Revelation 6. Mm -hmm. All right, so now we see how long it's gonna be. 42 months. Go ahead. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Uh huh. And it it was given unto him to make war with the saints. Now we see in here too, he going to make war with the saints. We saw that, that in Daniel 11, it was like the people who do know their God, they're going to do exploits and then they're going to be getting killed. They're going to have help, but it's going to be a little help. This is all during the end. And what we're showing is the theory of the purpose of the rapture is it, it's, it's not in the Bible, meaning the Bible is speaking contra. The per the theory of the purpose of the rapture is to protect the people, the church, from the great tribulation. But we see that people who know God are going through great tribulation. So we're going to understand that more as we proceed. But go ahead, keep reading. To make war with the saints and to overcome them. Mm -hmm. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon... Right, so this is the same one from Revelation 6. Go ahead. And all that dwell... Upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That's good. Verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. Uh -huh. And he had two horns like a lamb. Right. And he spake as a dragon. And he exorcised exercise. all the power of the first beast before him. Uh -huh. And caused the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound has was healed right because this first beast really is a representation of rome rome fell destroyed but his deadly wound was healed and he revitalized itself through the holy roman empire which eventually led to the holy catholic to the catholic church go ahead what verse 13 uh-huh and he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Right. It's the same, some of the same stuff we saw in Revelation when it was like, they're going to be getting destroyed by fire even. That was one of the things it said. Go ahead. And deceived them that dwell on the earth mm -hmm. by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound of a sword and did live. Uh-huh. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Uh -huh. And he caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. Go ahead. 
and that no man might buy or sell, save that he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So when we was in Revelation 6, it said that he was going to control the money. Now it's saying that this man here, you're going to have to have a mark, his mark. Otherwise, you can't buy or eat. Go ahead. You can do what you got to do now. Otherwise, you can't buy or eat or buy or sell. So what we're going to do is, because it said, and he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand and in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the, had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that have understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. Now, I'm gonna read this, and then I'm gonna take y'all to my whiteboard in here. And when I take y'all to my whiteboard, I'm gonna show you how we find out who this six 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 is, and how we come up with the six six six. Okay, so what I'm reading now. Is about the history of the papacy or popes. And I'm reading about Pope Innocent. Innocent was 37 years old and considered something of a whiz kid when he was elected. The intellectual nobleman and nephew of Pope Celestine III studied in Paris and Bologna before his uncle had made him a cardinal. He had floundered under, he had floundered under his immediate predecessor, Celestine III, due to a long-standing family feud. Spent most of that pontiff eighth-year reign writing great theological papers. He also traveled extensively, was deeply moved by the Shriner of the quick, quickly canonizing St. Thomas, uh, a, a Beckett at Canterbury. But on Celestine's death, at the extraordinary old age of 93, the young cardinal managed to persuade the Yoda clergy he was capable of becoming the Bishop of Rome. So this is Pope Innocent. He became the bishop or the pope. He was elected unanimously, unanimously on the second ballot, although there were misgivings. A German writer commit, uh, commented, Oh, the pope is so young. Lord help the church. Innocent, who was rapidly promoted from deacon to priest, before he was made pope. Now listen, you guys, because this is where we're going next with this. Was the first pontiff to make the wide use of the phrase, vicar of Christ. So Pope Innocent is the first one that says, vicar of Christ. Now if you were to look up the word vicar, it means replacement. So he's saying that the vicar of Christ is all English. He said, I'm the replacement of Christ. Now, it's not actually written vicar of Christ. It's actually written, and we're going to go over here. You faded it to black for now? Okay, good. We're going to go over here, and we're going to write this out up here. I had, I had um, got the wash rag ready so I can clean my board. Yeah. Oh, you can get the mic. Oh, I need the mic. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So I had, I hold it. So I had, um, so at any rate, what we're going to look at here is this 666. Okay. And here, let's set this here for a second. Because it said it had a number of a man. And so we're going to come here. And I'm gonna I'm gonna write this man's name out. This is Vicarious Carius Vila. Uh oh. Vila, and then this day. All right, now. This is the same thing. This right here equals the vicar of Christ. And 
vicar means to replace Christ. Okay? So this vicarious philodeia is Latin for vicar of Christ. Now, in Latin, each one of these words have a numeric value. The numeric value in case would be, for example, the number five would be represented, represented by the letter V. Mm -hmm. I is one. C, like C note, mm -hmm. that's a hundred dollars. C note is a hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. A has no value. R has no value. I, one. U and V, interchangeable. Mm -hmm. So that's another five. S has no value. So, so far we have, uh, we add this up. We got a hundred and ten. 11, 12, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Now, let's go to the Philly. So we got, I think F has no value. Then we have one. Then we have another zero. And we have one and one. So we now have three. Mm -hmm. All right. Then over here, E has no value. That I, again, is one. Mm -hmm. And D is 500. In Latin. Um, M would be a thousand. Okay. Okay. So, again, Vicar of Christ is the same thing. That's English. Mm -hmm. It's vicarious for the day. It's in this crown, too. Mm -hmm. Now, 501, right? Mm -hmm. So, if we take 1 plus 3 plus 2, that's 6, right? Mm -hmm. Then if you take 3... Plus one, uh-oh. Did I mess up somewhere? I bet I did. I had to. Uh we're gonna figure it out before we before we keep going, cause that don't that don't equal uh this should equal six 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 and so I'm missing something. Um I'm missing a fifty somewhere. So we got the hundred. Oh, wait a minute. I think the L is fifty, so let's look it up. Yes, L in Roman numerals, I think it's yeah, 50. L is 50. Okay, there we go. There we go. There we go. Bam. There we go. See? So, that's 53. All right, now this looks better. So, now we got 5 plus 1, that's 6. And then we got... Yo. Oh. Wait a minute. That's 5. Oh, and they go the other one. Yeah. Lord have mercy, I'm getting old. <laughs> six, six, six. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, vicarious fill a day, which equals vicar of Christ, is equivalent to six, six, six. Mm -hmm. All right. So, back to our, back to our Bible. So, when I get back over here, no Sean, were you able? Was that able to be seen? Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. 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 All right. So we're gonna get back over here as we get back to our burning midnight oil hopefully y'all were able to see that and observe so i'm gonna go back to revelation while my reader is getting everything set back up is that camera too high oh. <laughs> so again i'm at revelation 13 and it says in verse 16 he calls us all both small and great rich and poor free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand and in their forehead that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the mark of the beast or the number of his name. Let here is wisdom. Let him that have understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. So what we did was we went and to our board and we showed. That's the number of the Pope, 666. And we showed you how we figured that out. We took the name Vicarious for the day, and we took the uh, numeric value of each number that had one and equal 666. So this is who we're talking about, okay? Now, let's go to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. And we're going to start reading that verse 1. And again, we're looking at end time prophecy, the truth of the raptured church, the great tribulation. And so, so far, we haven't seen anybody ever leave the earth. 
This is the theory of the rapture. All of what we've been reading, we haven't found anybody leaving the earth. Revelation 12, and pick it up at verse 1. Go ahead. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven. Yes. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet. Uh -huh. And upon her head a crown of 12 stars. Go ahead. And she began, and she began, she being with child cried, uh, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. Uh -huh. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. Go ahead. And his tail grew uh, the third part of the, seven, of the stars of heaven uh -huh. and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered, yep. for to devour her child uh -huh. as soon as it was born. Keep going. And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations with the rod of iron. Yes. And her child was caught up unto God, unto God, and to his throne. So now, that's rapture right there. Dude got raptured. You know who this dude is we're talking about? Jesus. We're going to explain it. Verse 6. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three square days. All right, so a couple of things. Forty-two months was three and a half years. One thousand, uh, one thousand two hundred and three square days. That's the that's twelve hundred and sixty days. That's three and a half years. Okay. So this this chapter started in their period of great wonder in heaven. This is John. He's looking up in the sky still at his visions. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head uh, a, a crown of 12 stars. Now, if you go back into the book of Genesis, chapter 37, I think, Joseph, the dreamer, right, mm -hmm. had a dream. And when he had a dream, it was a woman uh, who had the sun and the moon under her feet or whatever, and she had 11 stars. And the daddy was like, shall me and your mom and your brothers bow down and worship you? Jacob was the daddy. This was Israel. Israel is the church of God. Israel, church of God. Israel, church of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, any rate. So Israel is the church. So it said, so when it says verse two, and she being with child, it's talking about the church or even more specifically a character in the church, Mary. Travelling in birth, pain to be delivered. There appeared another wonder in heaven, verse 3. The adversary. Behold, a great red dragon. So you got the woman, which is the church, and you got the red dragon. And it says his tail, verse 4, drew a third part of the stars of heaven, because it took a third of the angels with him. And did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, or the church, which was ready to be delivered, for it to devour her child as soon as it was born. So that's why when you see when Jesus was born, Herod was coming after Jesus. As soon as that child was born, it was like, we want to kill this child. But then it said the woman fled into the wilderness. Now, this woman again still represents the church. And there was a place of safety for her. It was the wilderness. She's running from the red dragon. Now, let's go get some more. Let's jump over to verse uh, 13. When the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he per persecuted the woman, which brought forth the man-child. Uh -huh. And to the woman were, were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time, and times and half a time, from the face of the serpent. Again, three and a half years. A time is a year. Times is two years. And then a half a time is a half a year. So that's three and a half years. That's the time period that this tribulation is going to take place. Okay, go ahead. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood. So the serpent the was coming after the woman, and the woman was sent out to be in the wilderness. This wilderness was prepared for her. Let's go to uh, Isaiah chapter 16 now. Isaiah chapter 16. So we don't see this the church getting raptured anywhere. We see the church having a place of safety being prepared for her. Rebel, I mean, Isaiah chapter 16. Isaiah chapter 16. And pick it up in verse 1. Send ye the lamb 
to the ruler of the land, uh, from Selah to the wilderness, to the mount of the daughter of Zion. Man, it's my fault. I was supposed to give you this on the map, and so that she could pull it up. But it's all good. Keep reading. For it shall be for for it shall be that as a wandering bird cast out of the of the nest, so the daughters of Moab shall be at the fords of Aaron. Mm -hmm. Take counsel, execute judgment, make thy shadow as the night in the midst of the noonday. Yep. Hide the outcast. Yep. Uh, beware not him that wandereth. So he said, hide my outcast. And who is it talking to? Send me the lamb to the ruler of the land from Selah to the wilderness. So in Isaiah, he's saying, hide my outcast in this wilderness. All right, keep reading. Let mine outcast dwell with thee. Who? Moab. So he said, Moab, that's the land. You go to the back of your Bibles, or for those that are watching online, you could go look up Moab and see where it is. This is where the wilderness will be. Go ahead. Be thou a comfort to them from the face of the spoiler, for the extortioner mm -hmm. is at an end. The spoiler ceases. The oppressors are consumed out of the land. Go ahead. And in mercy shall the throne be established. That's good. That's good. Okay. So we see here that we got a location for the outcast to dwell it was with Moab. And this is over there. This is the same wilderness the children of Israel went to before. Now, it's Jeremiah 30. That's where we're going now. Now. I'm going to show you why there's a wilderness. You know, the Bible actually is going to speak of the wilderness in two different two different ways. You got the wilderness as a place of safety. Like we just read in Isaiah 16. We're going to hide the outcast from the extortioner. Later, we got the wilderness where... After the Lord delivered the children of Israel out of America and out of all the countries we are, he going to bring us to the wilderness and bring us under the covenant. Just like he took the children of Israel out of Egypt and brought them into a covenant. They were out in the wilderness. He gave them the Ten Commandments. They were out in the wilderness. They were not yet in the promised land. God operates the same way. Now, what we... So then you say, well... What was the wilderness? What we're going to learn is the wilderness was like the land of Goshen. When God was going through Egypt, plaguing it before he delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt, just like he's going to deliver the children of Israel again out of Egypt. We're in Egypt right now. Uh, Deuteronomy 28, 68, I think, whatever the last verse is, it says, I will bring you back again to Egypt on ships. They were talking about slavery because we walked out of Egypt. You take ships to where? America. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to put you back in that bondage. That's what he told us. So Egypt is a representation of our bondage. So we're in Egypt now. So when the Lord begins to put his plagues and, and stuff down on the earth, he's going to sever or make a difference between Goshen and Egypt. Goshen will be the wilderness. So when we're going through this great tribulation, he going to have some place for you to be that safe, just like we had Goshen before. So I got to operate. All right. So Jeremiah chapter three, I mean, chapter 30, let's pick it up at verse three. We're going to read three through uh, 14. When you get there, go ahead. For lo, the days come, said the Lord. Yeah. That I will bring again the captivity of my people. So he said, when he said, I'm going to bring again the captivity, so I'm going to deliver you from this captivity. That's what that means. Go ahead. Israel and Judah, mm -hmm. said the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. Yep. And these are the words that the Lord spake concerning Israel and concerning Judah. What about it? For thus said the Lord, we have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Yes. Ask ye now, and see whether a man do a travail with child. Right. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins? As a woman in travail. Uh -huh. And all faces are turned into pl paleness. paleness. Go ahead. Alas. So he said, like, ask ye now and see whether a man do a travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loin as a woman in travail 
This is now he's talking about bringing Israel back. That's what he's saying. He's like, but before we get there, it's going to be rough action. Verse 7. Alas, for that day is great. What day? The day that we're talking about bringing Israel back. Go ahead. So that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. So he's calling this now the time of Jacob's trouble. That's another term for the great tribulation. Because we got the church going to the wilderness, but like, just think, you know, is your, uh, man, your, your grandma, most of they probably would, you know, like your teacher, you know, uh, Miss Guy. We're just going to use her. She is real, right? I mean, that we know of anyway, right? But she not a part of the church to the point that she know what to do, right? So the church going to head to the wilderness. Now, Sean going to be stuck here, though. He going to miss the boat for some reason. He'll take him out the trash or something. <laughs> so he going to be here helping to explain to people what's going on during the Great Tribulation. Explain to who? People like Miss Guy. She's still an Israelite. You dig what I'm saying? But she didn't know the truth. She don't have to take the mark of the beast. But somebody got to tell her. And if she don't, she's going to be faced with the fact that she could die. Because you can't buy or sell unless you have this mark. Mm -hmm. Okay? We're going to learn more about the Great Tribulation before we're done. You know what I'm saying? But this is where, this is like all roads are leading to, you know, when you look at all this stuff that's going on between the pol politics and wars in the Middle East and over there in Europe and Asia, to the violence that you see at home, to the corruption of the media, the corruption of the school systems, all the stuff that you see is leading you to this path that one day we're going to be when the Lord is going to come back for the children of Israel. And that's going to be, it's going to be worse than ever. Go ahead, what verse? Uh, I mean, in the seven. Go ahead. But he shall be saved out of it. But Jacob will be saved out of this time of Jacob's trouble. Go ahead. For it shall come to pass in that day, uh -huh. said the Lord of hosts, uh -huh. that I will break his yoke from off thy neck and will burst thy bonds, and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. Go ahead. But they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise, who I will yeah, raise up unto them. Uh huh. Then, so ultimately, this is what it's all about. The Lord, like we're not seeing rapture. We're not seeing nobody leaving the earth. The Lord plan on ruling over Israel from Israel on this planet. Go ahead. Therefore, fear thy not, O my servant Jacob, said the Lord, neither be dismayed. O Israel, for lo, I will save thee from afar, and thy seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return, and shall be in rest, and be quiet, and none shall make him afraid. Go ahead. For I am with thee, said the Lord, to save thee, though I make a full end of all nations, whether I have scattered thee. Right, so he said, like, I done sent you out everywhere, Israel. And I know I done made a full end of the nations that I scattered you at. You know what I mean? Like... This is how, this is all what the Lord is coming back to do. Go ahead. Yet, <clears throat> yet will I not make a full end of thee, mm. but I will correct thee in measure and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. Go ahead. For thus said the Lord, uh, thy bruise is in incurable. incurable and thy wound is grievous. Yeah, what happened to us? Like, you can't even fix what happened to us. Like, going through slavery... To getting to where we are today, from the Willie Lynches to the Jim Crows, you dig what I'm saying? You can't fix what happened to, and then we we that's just America. Like we can keep going, we can go back. You can't fix what happened to us. It's incurable. Go ahead. There is none to plead thy cause. Right. That's why we still slavery. Ain't we? Taxation without representation. Right. It was like who represents Israel? There's none to plead Israel's cause. Clause. Uh, cause. Go ahead. That thou mayest be bound up, mm -hmm. that thou hast no healing medicines. All thy lovers have forgotten thee. Mm. They seek thee not, for I have wounded them. For I wounded thee with the wound of an enemy, with the chastisement of a cruel one. For the multitude of thine iniquity, because thy sins were increased. So he's saying that's why we in America, and in, you know, and and, and and that's why we on the bottom, and we not in our own land. Cause he was basically telling you, like, yo, for what you did, man, like, I, 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 man, I had to punish you. 
I had to punish you. But he's going to bring us back, though. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 20. We're almost done. Ezekiel 20. Again, there is no rapture. And that's what we're going to learn from all this. And we see how the Lord is operating upon his return. Exodus chapter 20. and I mean, Ezekiel chapter 20 and pick it up at verse 10. 10 through 26. When you get there, go ahead. Wherefore, I caused them to go forth out of the land of Egypt and brought them into the wilderness. Mm -hmm. And I gave them my statue. Now, right here when you see wilderness, so the way you want to do it, you got to qualify the wilderness. Like here, this wilderness is a representation of after the Lord come back. Because this is when they got out of Egypt. So if you out of Egypt, then you free. And so that how that's going to operate is different than when the Lord take us to the wilderness when there's war going on within the lands. You follow me? Okay, go ahead. And showed them my judgments, which if a man do, he shall even live in them. Mm -hmm. Moreover, also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctified them. Go ahead. But the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. Well, they walk not in my statutes. All right, that, that's good right there. Because the Lord going to, let's jump down to 33. The Lord going to make a point to tell you something. Go ahead. As I live, said the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fire and with fury poured out, will I rule over you. So he's talking to Israel. He's like, I'm going to rule over Israel. Like, that's what the Lord, his whole objective. One day. Israel will be in their own land. It'll be like Wakanda. Real talk. You know what I'm saying? Like, you look, you looking crazy, what I'm saying. Just I mean, like, Wakanda was a city. Like, Jerusalem is a city. And it's going to have a great king. Like, Wakanda had the Black Panther. Jerusalem going to have Jesus. You know what I'm saying? Advance on the technology beyond, beyond anything Wakanda could think of, right? That's what I'm saying. Y'all have to be careful with these movies, man. We were talking about that earlier. Like if the earth was flat, they would be done put a they'd be done put a flat earth in one of these movies to try to prove this to you. You know what I'm saying? Like just just saying. But go ahead. And I will bring you out from the people and will gather you out of the countries wherein ye are scattered uh -huh. with the mighty hand and with the stretched out arm and with fury poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the people, and there will I plead with you face to face. Now we're reading this not to get to the wilderness. Because this wilderness takes place after the Lord come back. He's going to make a covenant with us. What I'm trying to show you really by taking you here is that, keep reading, verse 36. Like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so will I plead with you, said the Lord God. What I'm trying to show you is the same thing that happened in the past is going to happen again. So he said, just like I pleaded with you in the wilderness. Right? Then I'm going to plead with you in the wilderness later. That's when the Lord come back. Because he said, I'm going to rule over you. Now, going back to just like the days of Egypt. Let's go to Exodus chapter uh, 8. Exodus 8. So when he delivered us out of, the, uh, out of Egypt, this happened. Or before he delivered us, this happened. Exodus 8. And we got two more after this. So I know it's longer than we normally do, but it was still just 12 scriptures. You know what I mean? With just a little more detail and something like this, we can go into great detail. I'm trying to give you guys a um I'm trying to give you guys a basic foundation of understanding the wilderness. You know what I mean? We saw some not some numbers, you know what I mean, dates. The wilderness, the objective of the wilderness is to protect you from the Antichrist. You know what I mean? Like, that's the point. Because Antichrist is going to be putting his wrath out here like the Lord is too. Exodus 8, and you're going to get protected just like this. Pick up verse 16. And the Lord said unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Stretch out thy rod, and smite the dust of the land, that it may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. Uh -huh. And they did so. For Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod, and smote the dust of the earth. And it became lice in man. And in beasts, all the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. Go ahead. 
and the magicians did so with their enchantments to bring forth lice. Idiots. But they, but they could not. Mm. So there was lice upon man and upon beast. Then the magician said unto Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he heart and he hearkened not unto them. He read. As the Lord said, as the Lord has said. Uh huh. And the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning, and stand before Pharaoh. Lo, he cometh forth to the water, and say unto him, Thus said the Lord, Let my people go, yeah. that they may serve me. Right. Else, if thou wilt not let my people go, right. behold, I will send swarms of flies upon thee, mm. and upon thy servants, and upon thy people, and at thy houses, and the houses of the Egyptians shall be, fill, shall be full of swarms of flies. And also the ground whereon they are. Uh huh. And I will sever. Uh, now, pay attention to verse 22. They go, your wilderness. You know what I mean? It's not called the wilderness when we was in Egypt. It was called what? Go ahead. And I will sever in that day the land of Goshen, mm -hmm. in which my people dwell. Right. That no swarms of flies shall be there. So look what the Lord is saying. When, they, when we was in the church, when we was in Egypt, down in Egypt, He going to have us in Goshen. And he kept us divided from what he was doing to the Egyptians as he was bringing down his wrath. The Lord did. So Goshen would be the equivalent to us going to the wilderness. You know what I mean? Like if we, we wouldn't have to go to Goshen if, I mean, we wouldn't have to go to the wilderness if we could just know that all the hoods in America would be safe. But that's too far out and you know what I mean? So he like, yo, nah, y'all just need to come to the wilderness. But he ain't trying to destroy Israel when he bring his wrath upon Egypt. When I say Egypt, I'm talking about the new Egypt. The people that got us in bondage now. What verse? Uh, uh, middle of 22. Go ahead. To the end thou mayest know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. And here's the reason he says so that you will know I'm the Lord. So when he put us in the wilderness and we protect it, and we just looking out like, yo, they, they destroying everything over there. You gonna know, but that's the Lord doing this. Go ahead. And I'll put a division between my people and thy people. Uh -huh. Tomorrow shall this sign be. And notice what he said. I'm gonna make a division between my people and your people. That's what the wilderness is about. Let's go to Matthew 24. We got one more after this. This is Matthew 24, and then we're gonna go to John 3 and 13. That's why we're gonna end it. So we go to Matthew 24. We're going to pick up where we left off. As we uh, looking at some end time prophecy, we might look at some more stuff next week, some more end time prophecy. We don't do a lot of that, us, you know what I mean? So we might do that here some more at Burning Midnight Oil, you know. So um, in Matthew 15, I mean Matthew 24 and verse 15. So remember, we're still talking about from verse 3. Uh, we still talking about the end. What is the sign of thy coming the end of the in the end of the world, right? And in verse fifteen, read that again. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Antichrist, go ahead. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Uh huh. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Yep. Let him which is on the house top. Not come down to take anything out of his house. Right. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. Yeah. Now, there was a time when this happened before, 70 AD. And it was the same thing. See, the Lord operate like that. He do it more than once so you can understand how to get it done. And he, uh, if he do it the first time, he'll talk you through it. But then, you know, like for us, you know, it's like, yo, you see how I operate. I'm going to protect you. Go ahead. And woe unto them that are with child, mm -hmm. and to them that give suck in those days. Right. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Mm -hmm. We are all the way in the end time still talking about the Sabbath. Go ahead. For then shall great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. So this is the worst time ever, this great tribulation period. Worse than the Spanish Inquisition, the Holy Cause. The black plague, worse than everything, right? Because it's saying, uh, verse 21, For then shall be great tribulation, as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. So you got to understand, too, like, um, we're still dealing with the end of the world, and we have yet to see 
anybody leave this place. Go ahead. Not I'm talking about physically leave the earth. No, we got a wilderness set up for us, but we don't see a rapture. Go ahead. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. That's why it can't be seven years, because that we'll be done killed each other. Go ahead. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Uh huh. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, let's skip down to twenty seven. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even into the west, yeah. so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So it's not going to be a secret. That's not a secret. They talk about the rapture like he going to secretly. They show you in these movies and stuff like it was just like a fly by night. And I mean that for real. Like you airplane pilot just flying the plane at night. Next thing you know, he just disappeared. Dude driving down the street. Next, you know, all of us driving. Next thing you know, our cars is rolling with nobody in it. And nobody's knowing what happened. That's how they describe in the rapture. This is what they're making people believe of a rapture. The Bible ain't supporting nothing like that. The Bible is saying, oh, I got a place of safety for y'all when I do what I did to Egypt. When I do it to this land, I can save you from that. So you don't have to deal with that. Go to the wilderness. That's why I'm saying, like, I'm teaching it this way so you can understand what the Lord is doing. He's just repeating himself. When we was down there in Egypt, we were safe in Goshen. When the Lord comes back to smash Egypt, we'll be safe in the wilderness. Just that simple. Go ahead, keep reading. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Uh huh. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall be the sun shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven. And the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. Yes. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Yes. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. Right. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Go ahead. And when he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the heaven to the other. Keep reading. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. Mm -hmm. When his branch is yet tender... And put it forth leaves, ye know that summer is nay. Right. right. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the door. So he said, like when you see all the stuff that you see in Matthew 24, know the Lord coming back. That's what the chapter has been about. The Lord coming back. Go ahead. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Go ahead. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. All right. But of that day and hour knoweth no man. Right. No, not the angels of heaven, but my father only. Mm. But as the days of Noah. Noah. So now he's trying to give you a comparison so you can give another way to think of it. Go ahead. Were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So how did the Son of Man come like in the days of Noah? Because in the days of Noah, Noah was getting the ark together while y'all was doing something else. Go ahead. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, yep. and marrying and giving in marriage yep. until the day that Noah entered into the ark right. and knew not until the flood came. Till the problem came, you ain't know. Till the Lord came. Go ahead. And took them all away. Because the Lord going to be the flood. Go ahead. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Yes, sir. Then shall two be in the field. Now, when the Lord come back, two going to be in the field. Go ahead. The one shall be taken and the other left. Right. We read this earlier today. But what we didn't discuss is they go aware. They're going to meet the Lord in the sky to take the earth. It's about his return. Even in this chapter, what is the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? Go ahead. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. Yeah. The one shall be taken, the other left. The one that's taken, she been serving God. So she going to get the first resurrection. Go ahead. Watch therefore. Like Psalms say, we're going to beautify the meek with salvation. That's not a, this ain't a rapture that you bear witness to. You're seeing two people standing next to each other and one of them is getting resurrected, meeting the Lord in the cloud. But he ain't going to, you go read Psalm and say, hey, yeah, yeah, I'm going to have, I'm, I'm going to beautify the meek with salvation. They're going to have a two-edged sword in their hand. To execute vengeance upon the heathen. This honor have all the saints. You see what I'm saying? This is what's happening. We're going to meet up in cloud nine, though. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, like, like the dead and the living. 
Same thing Thessalonians was talking about. We're about to, we going to meet up in cloud nine, and then we're going to come back and thrash the earth. Go ahead. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. Uh -huh. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would have not and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Go ahead. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think, not the Son of Man cometh. Right. John chapter 3. When it says, because you don't know, he might come for you. So you need to be ready. John chapter 3. This will be our last one. And again, for those that are viewing, every Friday evening, Lord willing, we come at you with burning midnight oil. It's the last segment on the Sabbath where we dig into the Bible with 12 scriptures and we try to improve our understanding a little bit. Uh, anybody got uh, uh, any request on lesson types or something to that effect, feel free to post them up on any of these videos that you watch and Lord willing, we'll be able to get to it. But uh, John 3 and 13. And no man have ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. I mean, in that case, we can drop the mic. Because ain't nobody going up to heaven, ever. There is no rapture. When the Lord is coming back, you got the land of Goshen. That's what's going to protect you, a.k.a. the wilderness. When I get to the wilderness, we just going to create a big old sign that say Goshen. So everybody understand what we're doing over here. We here because the Lord is severing between the Egyptians and the children of Israel, the church. Those that had the common sense to get the heck out of the dodge because it's the time of Jacob's trouble. Worst time ever. Yeah, you ever read The Pit in the Pendulum? You know, man, it's uh, I think it's Don Quixote. I think that's the writer. I'm not sure. I don't remember it all. But it's about the Inquisitions and they would have you lay down and you in the pit and the pendulum just going across back and forth and it's a blade on that joint and it's just dropping it's getting lower and lower and then it's going to finally barely touch you and it's going to come back and it's going to barely and eventually it's going to cut you in two this was you know as a book called the pit and pendulum the point I'm getting at is worse than the Spanish Inquisition worse than the witch hunt of Salem it's going to be the worst time worse than the Vikings you know what I mean? This is going to be the worst than Indians scalping your heads. This is going to be the worst time ever on the planet. And then the Lord is going to come back. So, yeah, we need somewhere to be, somewhere safe. Otherwise, most of us wouldn't even make it. So, with that being said, brothers and sisters, I hope that uh, you guys were able to get some understanding on the truth of the rapture church, great tribulation. End time prophecy here at Burning Midnight Oil. And I thank you for your time. And I'm going to leave you with what I always leave you with. One man plants, another man waters. But it's the Lord that get an increase. I thank you for your time. Great job too, bro. Open script and I'ma read it right. Study to show thyself approved. You got to read it right. Every day hell, I'm just trying to show eternal life. Life. I'm just trying to show eternal life, life, this burning all at midnight. Who shall, who shall teach knowledge, make them understand, doc, doc. Who shall teach knowledge, make them understand, doc, doc. Who shall, who shall teach knowledge, make them understand, doc, doc. Line the phone line, line up on line. Who shall, who shall teach knowledge, make them understand, doc, doc. Who shall teach knowledge, make them understand, doc, Who shall, who shall teach knowledge, make them understand, doc, doc. Line the phone line, line, make them understand, doc, doc. Open.